I started using the steps after I retired, and uh, I started using the rail when I retired, and uh, I've had two falls. My wife and I, I'm not here for empathy. I appreciate your prayers. We were in a car accident last night, and they took me to the hospital, and they scanned my head and found nothing. So uh, I guess I guess I'm okay, you know, and uh, she's fine, a little bit sore. We T-boned somebody last night. Uh, somebody pulled out in front of us, a young man, and you need to pray for him. He's in the Methodist Children's Home, 15 years old on a driver's permit, and he had stopped, and, he, and uh, we could not, he darted right out in front of us. We couldn't avoid him, and unfortunately, we hit the uh, rear end uh, of his car and the back passenger door, and his aunt was seated in the front seat. It could have been a lot worse, and I have a nick on my head. And not much in it. But everything I preach today, I'm going to hear because it, come, it re- comes right back to me. The trauma of that, uh, uh, we thought not seat, yeah, seat bag uh, kind of unsettled me a little bit. So if, I, if I'm a little jerry today, uh, I'm probably not any worse than I am when I'm normal. But uh, anyway, pray for me. I will honor your time, respect your schedule. And uh, this church is very near and dear to me. I'm looking at my watch as I prepare here, and uh, 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 when I was 11 or 12 years old, I was not a Christian, but I attended Logan Street Baptist Church. The first church my family family was serious about was this church. My mom and dad were not Christians at the time. They are now, and they're in heaven, but I very vividly recall being in those uh, two-week-long Bible schools, and I learned the books of the Bible. And for eight years, I was in and out of church, never saved, got saved when I was 20, but I never, ever forgot the books of the Bible. And that planted some seed in my life and in my heart, and I've always, after I was saved, I've just really appreciated, not just as a preacher, but as a student of the Word, I've appreciated so much this wonderful book that we hold in our laps today and in our hands, the Word of God. I'd like you to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 17. Again, if I'm a little jittery, I'm a little a little uh, wobbly today, but I said, I'm going to preach to Logan Street if, uh, if I can stand upright, and God allowed me to do that. This church is very near and dear to my heart. My wife, uh, she's the one that wanted to join it more than I did at first. And uh, but you've got a great ministry here. This guy's top-notch behind us, uh, Brother Chris, and you can't beat Brother Allen if you wanted to. And uh, I'll tell you what, he's an outstanding, he's a man of God, and so is this man behind me. Matthew 17, I want to preach to you today on this subject, and it it, uh, uh, deals with each one of us, a mountaintop experience, and read the first nine verses of the book of Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, in verse 1, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him, and then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, uh, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. They were terrified, traumatized. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them or commanded them, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Pray with me briefly, please. Heavenly Father, as I stand in your presence, I pray, God, that I stand without sin in my life. Forgive me of any known sin, attitude, or action in my life that is not pleasing and is sin in your sight, O God. God, I pray that you might fill me with your spirit, fill each one here with your precious, powerful Holy Spirit to hear what you have to say to us from this passage. Oh, yes, it was written long ago that it has everything to do with everyone, each one that is here today. Save anyone who is unsaved. Draw us closer. Make Jesus more precious and wonderful 
and your word is the same. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What we have here in Matthew 17 is just a tremendous experience, a miraculous experience in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And what it is, it is a culmination uh, of everything that Jesus had been teaching and preaching and leading his disciples in his ministry in from the very beginning. Uh, that he would then eventually suffer many things and go to the cross. And really at this point in the, their lives and uh, the ministry uh, uh, that he had, they really didn't get that message yet that this one named Jesus, who they loved so much, uh, was going to die on a cross because they wanted him to be more than that. They wanted him to be king. But all of his ministry, previous ministry, teaching, preaching, dealing, is a culmination of what is going to take place in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on this mountaintop, and they have what I want to call today, what anyone would preach from this passage would call a mountaintop experience. Now, let me say this by way of introduction, that when they have this mountaintop experience, really, none of them, except Jesus, that is, None of his disciples have anything on us because we all, if we're saved, have already had one mountaintop experience. So what I hope this message does today would call out anybody that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they can have the greatest experience that they'll ever have at any point in their life, and that is a full-blown, born-again experience and come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Number two, I would want everyone here today to have the experience of knowing that once you've been to the cross and you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that does not have to be the end of your mountaintop experiences. A mountaintop experience awaits every believer in Jesus Christ who will follow the instruction of this passage of Scripture in three simple truths. And I want to talk to you about those here today. I want to have more mountaintop experiences, don't you? I want you to know when you leave here today, we're going to talk about church. And attending worship here can be a mountaintop experience. First of all, what these disciples do, as selected by Jesus Christ, they ascend this mountain with Jesus Christ, and they go up the mountain or they climb the mountain to really, for the first time in their life, to see Jesus like they've never seen him before. They climb the mountain, number one, to really see Jesus Christ. And they get uh, an eyeful when they get on this mountain. They, they go up this mountain, and the Bible says that Jesus calls them apart. He takes them individually uh, as well as, as, as a group. And when they go up this mountain, he takes them apart, which means that he has something intentional in taking these three that will forever change their lives. And I think when he says he takes them apart, it means that he wants every individual to have these mountaintop experiences with Jesus Christ. You say, why did he take Peter, James, and John? Well, was that they were more deserving? No. I believe, after reading the Gospel of Matthew, that they took these men, <laughs> excuse me for this thing, I'm getting used to it. I believe they took these three men because they needed the experience. For you see, late earlier, Peter would say, well, you're not going to the cross, Jesus. Get, uh, Satan, you need to get behind, Satan needs to get behind you. You're not really going to go to the cross. And later, James and John's mother, 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 I can't get that word out, the mother says, I, I want my sons to be great. And could you tell me how they can sit at either side in your kingdom? So from that, Jesus is going to show us how to be great without worrying about what our position will be when we get to heaven. You see, Jesus Christ, as he's there and now in this, this experience, Jesus Christ is transfigured before them. His, his clothing becomes white. Uh, his face becomes brilliant and radiant, and for the first time in Peter and James and John's life, they see Jesus not only in his humanity, they see Jesus in 
his glory. They see Jesus like they've never seen him before. And I want to tell you something. That describes the day that you got saved, the day I got saved, we all got saved. We, for the first times in our lives, saw Jesus like we had never seen him before. You see, he made himself real to us the first time. When you get saved, you get converted, born again, whatever you want to call it. You see, we get uh, uh, Jesus in all of his glory. We meet the crucified one. We meet the resurrected one. We meet the anointed one. We meet the coming one. We meet Jesus for all that he is. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get through with this thing here. We see Please, I'm not used to preaching with something around my ear, and I never wore an earring in my life. And I don't intend to. All right. I'm used to this lapel mic, and these things bug me. It's not our, not our, our sound people's uh, problem, it's mine. Uh, but we need super glue next time. Uh, <laughs> well, well, Jesus undergoes this change. And you see, it was important that they... They see Jesus uh, in all his glory. I'm, I'm fumbling around here, messing with this thing. In an instant, Jesus is changed from his humanity to his glory. Remember, his humanity was just a temporary covering so he could live among us and, and serve and become human like we are, become the, if you will, the God-man. But when they saw Jesus that day, they saw him like they'd never seen him before, describing a mountaintop experience that I once had when I was uh, uh, 20 years old at Casey Avenue Baptist Church, sitting on the second pew on the left side, Don Mullinax was there, we were ordained together in the ministry, and I walked forward, and for the first time, the Lord gripped my heart and convinced me that he was God, Jesus Christ is God, and I'm just a mere young man. And I'm a sinner, and only he is Savior. And I needed him. And I walked from that second aisle, and I bowed up here, and I climbed the mountain to see Jesus for all he really is. And he forgave me of all my sins. He saved me. He came into my life. He changed me. He put me on a new path for my life. And I've never been the same since. What an experience that was. And you said, well, they got to see Jesus, and we didn't. I'll be there in a minute. So here they climb the mountain and they see Jesus. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful to see Jesus? You're going to see him someday. Face to face, I'll see my Redeemer. And so will you. But I'll tell you what, if that wasn't enough, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. Have you lost a loved one? I've lost quite a few myself. And being a pastor, I've lost a whole lot more. And if you're a Christian... You've lost a lot of bro brothers and sisters. I preached a lot of funerals. And I've been there a lot of times with people, and I've, uh, it's a sad time. But I want to tell you what this passage says when Moses and Elijah appeared. That is an encouragement to me about what is yet to come. How about you? They appear, and when they do appear, they're talking with Jesus. They're actually uh, making audible sounds. They're, they're carrying out a conversation with Jesus. And they're talking about, according to Luke, in the same account, they're talking about Jesus' decease that is yet to come in the city of Jerusalem. And Moses and Elijah are there. So Peter gets the great idea. He says, well, hey, we got Moses here. We got Elijah and we got Jesus. Why don't we just build three temples or tabernacles Actually, the word means booths, B-O-O-T-H-S, and let's stay here. But he missed the whole point. First of all, nobody's equal to Jesus. Now, if you're going to build three temples, Jesus ought to have the best one, amen? But not only that, he missed the whole point of what this experience was about. And what happens here, they, they climb the mountain and they see Jesus. Moses and Elijah appear, and Peter misses the point. But it reminds us of our first time when we climbed the mountaintop experience and we saw Jesus Christ. So they climbed the mountain to see God. You know what our duty is as believers? is to help people and to guide people who do not know Jesus Christ personally to help get them to climb that mountain for the first time in our witness with our love 
our lips and all the learning that we have from God's Word and bring them to Jesus Christ that they might be saved and climb the mountain for the first time in their lives. Number two, when they get up on that mountain, the Bible says while they're there, they make their full surrender to God. They got their eyes full. Now they get their ears full. They climb the mountain, and now they surrender to God. Peter is still speaking. If you look at verse 5, note this. Peter didn't ever know when to shut up. Uh, He didn't know when to let up. He was a different man in the New Testament than he was in the Gospels. It says, While Peter yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God spoke. How about that? Three miracles in one. We see Jesus like we've never seen him before. Moses and Elijah show up who've been dead for hundreds of years in some kind of a temporary bodily existence uh, awaiting Jesus to go to the cross. And then God speaks out of heaven. And notice what he says. As God now takes his rightful place in the conversation, and God says these words. This, and here's the key verse, I always call this is a zinger in the message. This is something I really got, and I hope you get it. I want you to get it. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. We're not done yet. Hear ye him. That's why God tells these disciples. The voice of God from the cloud in that great, magnificent uh, experience of glory God interrupts Peter, and he takes his rightful place in the conversation, and he said, we need to hear what this man Jesus said. That's the best advice you'll find in the New Testament, and you find it only one other place when Jesus turns the water into wine, and uh, Jesus' mother tells the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, what? Do it. So we have two testimonies to the fact that we need to hear from God We need to listen to God and do whatever God tells us to do. So now they're on the mountain, and they're already, they've seen Jesus like they've never seen him, but now then all of a sudden, they hear God, and they said that Jesus Christ is going to suffer on that cross in in summary of the verses on this passage of Scripture. So at this, but notice now, suddenly after they hear uh, these words, The disciples look, and Moses and Elijah have vanished like a vapor. They're gone. But Jesus is there only. There's very much significance to that. Because, you see, we are realizing at this moment what they realize. They are realizing what we've realized, and that's this. That everything, listen carefully now, everything is really all about Jesus. It's all about him. Max Lucado was right when he he said everything's about about Jesus and him supremely. It's all about Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen to him to come to him. We need to listen to him to follow him. We need to listen to him to get direction for our life. We need to listen to him when we're, we're suffering and we're hurting or we've had a tragic loss. Some trauma has come into our life. We need to listen to him when we're making our decisions. We need to listen to Jesus about everything. Jesus is an expert. Jesus has the best advice. A whole book of Proverbs is really written about Jesus and the wisdom of God. We need to listen to Jesus more, I think, sometimes than we do our husband and wife, to be honest with you. Although I do listen to my wife. But we need to listen to Jesus. We don't need to be listening to anyone else to get the wisdom that God can bring. Jesus is the answer to everything. He's the answer to every need that we have. At this point, they fall on their knees, the Bible says, and they are terrorized, down in verse 6. Because now, they've not only really seen Jesus, they're surrendering to Jesus. And sometimes we fall back from that. You know, we're surrendered for a little while, or, or, you know, something happens, and we take a few steps backward, or maybe just a step backwards, and we need to renew our life unto God. Uh, that happened to my wife and I. Uh, I was a 
getting ready, ready to go back to seminary, and we went to a conference in, at the IBSA State uh, Conference building, and we heard a pastor from Titusville, Florida, who preached and taught on spending time daily with God. His name was Peter Lord. How many of you know who Peter Lord is? And his whole, his whole reason for being there was to talk to believers and preachers and deacons and leaders in churches and Christians of, of all kinds from all uh, different denominations and to get them to be certain that they were spending daily time with God. So for six days a week, for six solid months, I spent not looking for a sermon, not trying to get together a Bible study, not trying to get words to say to somebody in grief or a witnessing word, but just for me and God, six days a week, 30 minutes a day, for six months, listening to God, getting up, and spending at least 30 minutes with God. Prayer, Bible reading, and Bible study. And I learned more in those six months, probably, than I had learned in the previous seven, eight, ten years. I don't, I don't remember exactly what year that was that I had learned in God's Word in all the other years combined. At that point, I got back I got back on the center of the altar again, and I surrendered my life afresh and anew. Yes, I was saved, but that would be my second mountaintop experience when I saw the necessity to spend time alone with the God who made me and the God who saved me and the God who loved me and cared for every facet of my life. God cares for me. No one cares for you like Jesus. And he made a tremendous change in my life. I began to do things and say things and act. I'd been a lousy preacher. I had I lost this baby again. Can you pick me up on another mic? I'm either going to hang myself or that car accident didn't do me a bit of good last night. I get a little bit excited when I preach. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? This didn't even run. All right. I, I want to I be back and be serious. I think I made my second point. I think I got three minutes left. Let's nail the last one, or let's try to nail the last one. Here's the points if you're writing them down. Number one, and I got to stay away from those steps. Number one, you climb the mountain to see, to really see Jesus. Number two, while on the mountain, you make your full surrender to Jesus. When you come down from the mountain, it's time to go to work and serve Jesus. I'll tell you how you know when you've worshipped. You've worshipped when you want to do something for Jesus. When you want to say those sweet, kind, loving words. You know when I substitute a lot at the high school and out here at the GED, I teach at the Red Lake. I, I try to smile every day. I try. Sometimes it's hard. I've been through a lot. But I try to smile. I do my best, Court. I try to look like Court Jones over there, and that's hard to do. Isn't he a good smiler? I'll tell you what, I do my best to try to be uplifted. One time I was at a funeral home. I can tell you this story. I'm, 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 oh, yeah, get, up, get back there. We come down to the mountain to serve God. We come back down the mountain uh, to serve God. Now, you can apply these three principles at any given point, and they work all the time. Some of you need to get surrendered. There are some people here today, if you've not trusted Christ, maybe, or for sure, you need to trust Christ. You need to get saved. You need to get in this church and, and get involved and uh, be a good church member and a great servant. When they came down, there happened to be a little boy uh, who had a demon. The disciples couldn't cast him out, but Jesus did. And the whole point is, when they got off this mountain, and now i got a minute and a half, they, they, they came down the mountain to serve Jesus. Now, it's interesting in doing that. Let me, let me summarize what I want to say. When they came down uh, to do this, Jesus told them two things after they had this experience. Now, you put yourself in their place. You've just seen Jesus in all his magnificent glory, just like you're going to see him the last breath you take on this earth. Exactly. 
They have nothing on us. You say, now, wait a minute, they saw Jesus. Well, Peter says in 2 Peter about this experience, look it up, chapter 1, 16 through 19, he said, you have a more perfect word, a, a more a, a solid rock-ribbed word. Uh, you have the word of God. So you see Jesus every time you read the Bible. You don't have to see, oh, I'd believe in God if I could see Jesus. Oh, if I could just see his face. No, you wouldn't. A man died and went to hell, and uh, he wanted somebody to go back and, you know, back and tell his brothers so they, they didn't go to hell. And you know what he said? They've got the law, and they got the prophets. Read your Bible, and you'll see Jesus. Same advice. Well, they come down from the mountain, and they serve God. Uh, my time's up. I want to tell you what a mountaintop experience is. Here's what it is. A mountaintop experience is when you encounter in your own personal life Jesus Christ and you really see him and he speaks to you and he changes your life. You hear God's voice, you respond. School teachers, you know what I'm talking about. Even as a substitute in the teaching I do out there, sometimes you teach, don't you, Mr. Miller? And they're not getting it. You've got to hear it and you've got to heed it and you've got to do it. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you want to have a mountain topic, you want to have a great Bible study this week, just go home and get in your private place, take time with God, and pray and read His Word. And I'm telling you, you've got a mountain top experience awaiting you. It happens. You can have a bunch of these. A mountain top experience. Well, what have you seen? What's God done for you? He saved you, didn't He? He saved us. What have you heard? What do you know? Well, a mountaintop experience causes us to go serve God and tell unsaved people what we've heard, what we know, how God has helped us in our own personal life. I just get personal testimony. It's not to be braggadocio this morning. I was hit on a bicycle at age six, knocked unconscious, taken to Jefferson Memorial Hospital. Delivering my papers, I was hit in front of the Granada Theater at age 12, knocked cold, was taken to Good Samaritan Hospital. 20 years ago this March, I had a heart attack, four bypasses, and uh, was flown from Carbondale when my daughter was in, before medical school, was in college, and they flew me to Springfield and saved my life. My heart was one-third what it was, now it's two-thirds what it was, and they saved my life. I had a tumor in my ear that took seven hours to get out and drill into this empty head of mine, get all the infection out, so I'm totally deaf in my left ear. Last night, we T-boned somebody, and in about 15, about 15, 20 seconds, we would have been doing 55 miles an hour in 15 more seconds, and I might have got to really see Jesus face to face if it hadn't been as it was. Now, that's how my life has been. Every day's a gift. But don't look at me and feel sorry for me. Have sympathy or empathy for me. Look at yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. Life is amazing. It appears for a moment, and a moment can be gone. I could be a, be dead, but much alive in heaven today. That's all right. You don't know what's going to happen. So it's time. It's time if I've been to the mountaintop, and I've seen Jesus, and he's changed my life, and he's changing me bit by bit, conforming me more into his image. It's about time I get busy for God. And if you are busy for God, praise the Lord. I can't wait till the new building comes. Chris, I don't believe it's going to be big enough. It's, it's not going to be big enough. I'm not a great soul winner. I, I, I've been able to witness to a lot of dying people and get them to heaven on the 11.59th hour to preach some of those funerals. But I tell you what, we need to be I think today, when people are so skeptical, my time's up. When they're so skeptical, skeptical, hard to believe anything, don't trust what, what's, what's your angle. We need to live it. If we live it, we'll earn the right to share it. Let others see Jesus in, in you and me. I, I was reading through the song, and I'm done. What I'm talking about, a mountaintop experience. Next time you sing this song, sing it like you mean it. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus?
by his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed that he is mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. I love the cardinals. <laughs> I love the blues. I love the kids at school. You know, I love what I'm doing. First time in life, I'm doing everything I want to do, when I want to do it, and enjoying it immensely. I'm not going to grow. I may grow older, but I'm going to try to get bolder. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord, I see. Go to the mountain. If you've not been there, if you're unsaved today, if you've never repented of your sins, trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be the greatest thing that ever happened to you and ever will happen to you till you get to heaven. And number two, make sure you stay in the center of the altar when you feel like, well, I'm not quite as surrendered as I need to be, whether it be by attitude or action, you know, just the way we carry ourselves. Christian, I would be a happy person most of the time. I know there's hard times, but I tell you what, we can still smile because God loves us and Jesus loves us. And then let's let's stay at work. You know, my, if I, I don't, I'm not I'm a new member here, but I feel like I've been here a lot in my life because I started here and now it's probably ending here. And since I preach so many Sundays, I don't get to see you all. So I want to tell you, if you're not, if somebody's here today and you're not a member of a church, you won't find a better one. They really worship the Lord. You know why we joined this church? We joined this church because we went to about eight after Park Avenue where I pastored, and we really felt, believed, that you all really worship God here. That's what we felt. When I first met him and his wonderful wife over here, and, and uh, Alan, his wonderful wife, I've worked out there some at that school and know her even in another way, and you have a wonderful staff and wonderful people. And listen, if you're contemplating, join the church. Why not? Church, however they would receive you, they know more about that than I do. And find a church home. Find a church home. And uh, surrender. Let's pray.